All right. Hey, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm excited to have Paul Klein joining us. Paul, welcome. Hello, Michael. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited for, uh, for this discussion. I know we just talked recently uh, when I was on your podcast, so it's great to uh, do a little role reversal. Uh, and yeah, today I'm, I'm really you know, looking forward to this conversation because you've worked with some very well-known brands, uh, Target, Slack, UC Berkeley, Cracker Barrel, uh, Holiday Inn, KFC, Taco Bell, Yum Brands, JCPenney, Sherwin-Williams, a bunch <laughs> of others, right? Like it's just, it's well-known brands. Um, but you started off in construction and building code enforcement, then decided to go out on your own um, and really kind of, you know, establish a couple of different companies focusing on the Accessibility Compliance and America Disabilities Act. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Absolutely. Yeah, we had a background in um, construction inspection with uh, local and private companies uh, for 18 years. And then I uh, left about 10 years ago in the heat of the recession in 2009. Um, never was to be a W-2 employee ever again. Uh, I've been consulting ever since uh, with many of those brands you've mentioned and, and many others. Right. And for everyone outside of the U.S., W-2 employee just means you know, it's kind of like you're a full-time employee. You get your W-2 end of the year, right? Shows how much you made and, and all that kind of stuff. So you went from being an employee in an organization to launching your own consulting business. Correct. Correct. Uh, and the companies like Target and Slack and, and Taco Bell, uh, were these clients of the accessibility compliance consulting and software company that you have? Yeah, yeah. Mainly, mainly the software company we just started three years ago. So when I transferred from my organization and being a professional, you know, mid-manager, um, you know, into my own consulting business, I honed in on a, what, I, what and you, I know you talk about this, Michael, about being hyper-niched, super-niched. And it was solving a specific problem uh, in the marketplace for a specific need. In that particular case, it was for um, anyone or any facilities, whether they're Fortune 500 companies or mom and pop shops in Main Street um, that was related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so that's how I, I started out just with mom and pop shops locally, you know, just started small and organically. And then over time, I invoked what I call the three pillars of revenue and eventually, um, through my training courses and networking, got my first Fortune 500 client. And then uh, it just branched from there um, over the last 10 years. But it didn't take long to break into that because I was so um, hyper-niched or focused yeah. down to a specific area. And when you, as you know, when you solve that problem, that specific problem people need, they'll find you. Yeah. That's certainly the case. There's a lot of good lessons in there. I love how you were saying, yeah, it didn't take long. And I was just thinking, you just mentioned 10 years you know, before you said that, and it's like the, the saying that a lot of people say, yeah, yeah overnight success, 10 years in the making. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so let's, let's dig more into, cause I really want people to understand your area of, of expertise. Uh, what exactly is your consulting company about? What services and products are you providing in, you know, relation to accessibility compliance and, and the software that you've also de uh, developed for that? Yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, I have three, three companies. So my personal brand and podcasting, which we can talk about, um, is, is separate, but, but my company that I've had for the last 10 years is, is related directly related to the Americans with disabilities or ADA compliance. And that is in America, all facilities have to be made to comply for persons with disabilities. As you know, there's a certain percentage of the, of the population that have inherent disabilities as well as vets and other, other population. And, and having them inclusive and in, included in, in society and being able to have a free, um, you know, be able to go out their business and have the freedom just like we do as able-bodied people is very important and which is why the U.S. adopted this law back in the early 90s. And so for a lot of the businesses and a lot of these big corporations, it's very um, a complex law. It's enforced through um, lawsuits and litigation as opposed to a, uh, an authority or a, um, say, a, like, a, like a, an inspector or something. It's all self-regulated. Self, um, um, self so they need consultants and they need experts to come in and say, hey, how do we make our facilities compliant? And then you have to um, mix in all the state regulations. Every state has their own separate set of regulations. So it's a, it's a complex niche, but it's related to architecture, um, construction, engineering, and uh, those, those fields. And, and so uh, are you getting involved then before a building is actually built or are you brought in once it's already in place and, and then you go to work? 
Both. Um, a lot of the larger uh, um, companies that you mentioned, what we would do is um, they have, a, you know, 3,000 sites nationwide. And, um, and, they, and what a lot of those brands do is they'll freshen up their brand, you know, with a facade and image uh, um, update every, you know, every f- five to seven years. And so what we would do is go in and do a, what we call a pre-inspection and we would, we would capture all the issues and so forth. And then they can take that report and then incorporate it into their, their design and their construction phase. And then we would come back and do a, um, a what we call a post inspection. So it's kind of a, a property audit or a, a right. inspection type report. Got it. Okay. And then you mentioned that for you, you, know, you started kind of very organically, uh, very focused, got some, I think you call them mom and pop shops, right? The smaller kind of businesses, which then down the road led to the, the much larger kind of global brands that you've worked with. But take us back to actually how you went about getting your first client. Like, were you knocking on doors? Did you leverage some relationships and, and referrals? How did you go about getting that first client? Yeah, leveraging, leveraging my, I mean, I had an 18 year career. So I was 40 when I left and went out on my own. And so I had a lot of industry contacts and just, just putting a stake in the sand and saying, Hey, I'm doing this now was a big part of it. And then I was able to leverage that in with some of my existing network. So Mm -hmm. as a, as many people make that transition from corporate to, to consulting, you know, you got to lean on your existing clientele and it. And once you put that stake in the sand, so to speak, you know, then you'll attract those people. And so, yeah, I just started working with that existing network. And then I also reached out, basically I had a rule back then. I would go anywhere uh, within driving distance to speak for up to two hours for free. And I would, I wouldn't do this as a sleazy marketing, Hey, bye, bye, bye for me. I would truly be interested in helping the businesses, the community, whatever organization I was speaking to and helping them have a better understanding in that niche. And then that led to consulting opportunities and uh, numerous of them over over time. And pretty soon I found myself, um, you know, so busy. It was bringing on, bringing on additional resources and uh, 10, what we call 1099 or uh, sub consultants. Um, Right. So kind of like contractors or right. Other people within the organization to, to support your growth. And then what would you say, I mean, the, at that, in that early stage, you were leveraging your network, but you also mentioned that you went to go speaking and that also brought in uh, opportunities. Was speaking more powerful than leveraging your network or, like, or was there something else that was really contributing to the, the leads and the inflow in those early days? Yeah, initially for the first, uh, you know, contracts and first initial jobs, it was leveraging my network. But then I, um, by speaking, that's what led me to my first Fortune 500 client. Mm. And, um, you know, and what I, and I call, um, the three pillars of revenue, you know, having a, um, a web presence or an e-presence social footprint presence, then having a speaking presence and then, a what I call a training and education or speaking presence. Anyway, mm. it was kind of all worked together, but what happened is we started doing, um, speaking and training engagements and one of the fortune 500 companies sent their people, um, that were from the department that handled this kind of thing to our training. And, you know, they spent four days with me. So uh, the relationship was built and now that relationship didn't, um, didn't develop to almost a year later to an actual check coming into my bank account. But the, the, the um, path was set in place early on by doing uh, speaking and training. So I think the speaking and training component can uh, add to your, you're, you're leveraging your existing client to, um, yeah. network and then helping you bootstrap up or, or climb that uh, up that ladder. Definitely. And so take us through, Paul, for those who are listening going, yeah, I can see that that makes sense. Like, I understand I should be doing some speaking. How do they go about actually doing it? Like, just step by step, what, what did you do? Like, how do you identify where to go speak? And then how do you actually get on stage? Yeah. So first thing is I'm not, a, I was never, I don't consider myself a speaker, although now I'm trying to get into more of that. And I officially do call myself a speaker, but early on, no, I'm an introvert. I, I don't want to be on stage. So yeah. what you do is the trick is you mask it in training. You're training people in your expertise. If you love and care about what you're doing and you love your niche and your area of expertise, just think of it as training. You're just training some people in that area. And, and then, and that's where your passion will come out that's where your excitement and then that will help you get over the fear of talking in front of people. And so whether I was talking to five people or 500 people, yeah. you know, I was just training at that point and just talking about my area of subject that I just dove into. And, and what were you doing then to actually get on, on stage? Like who, who do you know, like how do you actually know who to reach out to? Was yeah. this, these, were these specific kind of compl- like um, accessibility, you know, uh, disability related 
groups or events or associations or tell us a little bit more about how you identified who to actually target? Yeah, first uh, we started uh, doing like uh, local businesses and in America here we have Chamber of Commerce where there were a lot of business community work. Right. work. So we were going where they were. Then we reached out to regional um, annual business meetings, um, AIA um, conferences, industry conferences, restaurant, uh, mm-hmm. retail conferences, things like that that were bigger and more regional. You know, but, bigger. but the first few were, were they the Chamber of Commerce? Yeah. The, the initial ones? Yeah. And so what, what would you do? You would find, okay, I'm going to target the you know Northern California Chamber of Commerce or whatever it is. And would you, who would you send an email to or who would you pick up the phone? Like what, take us through what you did there and, yeah, and who perfect. it was. Perfect example. You, you know where Napa is. I'm yep. sure you know where Napa is. Wine country, right? So, sure. um, place. Little, yeah, Napa had a, uh, a, a chamber person. I just reached out to her uh, via the web, said, hey, uh, if you're interested in having a uh, work group session for your, for your business community and you'd like to learn more about the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and how it can help your businesses, you know, let me know. I'd be willing to come over and talk to you because I'm real close there. And uh, they said, yeah, that's, that's perfect. We've so been you wanting You were talking about fees. They didn't have to pay or anything. You were just saying, if you want me to come by, I'm happy to talk about this. And you, you call it a working session? What was that? You, what did you say? Yeah, I said a workshop, a workshop. You call it a workshop? Yeah. Okay. It was just an informative workshop. And at that time, I pretty much would go, I would speak up to, we'd, have a, we'd speak up to two hours um, without um, any fees. It Got was it. just quasi marketing and it was getting our brand. We were, we were still young, you know, I had a business partner and uh, it was with me and we just did, you know, we didn't, we weren't established yet, so we couldn't charge, you know, now it's, you know, to get us for two hours, it's, it's just, it's not cheap. So we just don't do that anymore. But when we first started out, that was absolutely the mm-hmm. way to go is starting small, being willing to invest in other people first and then, um, then once you get your foothold in the marketplace and established, um, you know, it just takes time. It just doesn't happen overnight. How long did it take you from doing that first speaking event or workshop, right? Or training, as you called it, from doing that initial one to actually seeing that turn into a paying client? Um, it, uh, let's see. It happened right away because what would happen is um, once we got in front of people and a relationship was built, inevitably a week or two later after those types of workshops, we would get a phone call and yep. get hired. So right. it is, it, that's why I think that is when you're first starting out as a consultant, getting out and, and doing a free, you know, one hour, two hour, just informative workshop in the business community industry will, will jumpstart your, your consulting business. Yep. Um, and you'll get, and not only that, you'll get a return. It, it's like podcasting. You got to put a lot of effort into it, but it really to go out and talk for two hours, you know, on your topic, it's really quasi marketing and you're just really there to serve. And it really has a ripple effect that you may see two weeks, three weeks or six weeks later. Yeah. You know, I like to describe it as it's like planting seeds, right? Everything that you yeah. do in marketing, as long as you're in this business for the long term, right? You can start seeing results in the short term, but you have to approach it with the mindset of, uh, of the long term. And so you plant those seeds now because the sooner that you plant them, the sooner that you're going to start to reap the rewards and the benefits of, you know, of that beautiful fruit or flower or whatever it is yeah. that you're planting. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's a really great example. And also I think what's important for people to recognize is even though you might just get that first one and it's free and it's not like the, a big audience, it doesn't really matter because you're now getting leverage, right? You can mm-hmm. now approach another place and say, Hey, I just spoke with the Napa chamber of commerce, exactly. or XYZ chamber of commerce. Um, and I'd love to come speak years and they go in their mind. It's like, Oh, you spoke there. Okay. I guess you actually can yep. do it. Sure. Right. So for people to understand that it doesn't matter how small you start every step, right. Every accomplishment then builds or helps to build the next one. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't long after that. We were at uh, downtown San Francisco at the AIA San Francisco, one of the biggest AI chapters in the, in the, in the nation. Yeah. And so it just, people started hearing about it and it just, it just snowballed. And so again, you don't get an immediate return, but you do get a ripple effect and it comes back to you in many ways. Right. And, you know, very quickly. And so time. we've been talking a little bit about how you got started. Um, but there's going to also be people listening right now and tuning in who already have established businesses like you have an established business, right? You got actually more than one. Um, but what's working for you today? So fast forward several years later, the business has done well, you've worked with some very well known clients. What's working best for you right now to generate leads and opportunities for, for your company, for your <laughs> consulting business? I, I wish I could say I have some fancy secret for you, but because we have a 10 year track record and a developed client base, I literally am not 
spending any money on AdWords or anything and, and, and my funnel just keeps coming. I mean, I'm right now, I'm actually not even trying to work or build on that business. It's just clients are coming to me just through referrals and yep. existing networks and that, and because I'm building my personal brand over at paulkline.net, which is, you know, my pricing and, and uh, coaching uh, program. But my existing uh, business is, is just pretty much on autopilot. You know, I've invested um, the, over the last 10 years in that. And so the network's there. And so that's the, the, the beauty of it is that once you, once you put in all the hard work and grinded your teeth and grind, pounded the pavement, you know, and, and it's a high six figure build uh, business, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it just, it just, it's on autopilot. Now I could really ramp it up if I really put more effort into it. But right. like I say, I'm, I'm branching off into the speaking and coaching, uh, uh, stuff uh, like many of your listeners are and um, and that business is is eventually that business will ramp down as my other one ramps up got and, it and so forth and, and how many people do you have now in that business how many kind of team members well here's the thing uh, when my business partner and I we've both had managed employees for over 20 years and our number one rule is no employees got <laughs> so it okay it, it's hampered our growth probably to some extent but I really believe in what I call the six or seven figure small and that is um, being lean and mean, much like you, Michael, um, and your brother, you know, where you, you know, you don't need to have a big agency and hundreds of employees to, to do well and have the freedom and the, the lifestyle uh, that you want. So we lean on a lot of um, sub consultants, what we call 1099s um, in, in America here, or people that are um, basically team members. And we bring in for projects, all on project base. Hey, I've got, you know, I've got a big project out in the Midwest. Can you do it? If you can't do it, I got another guy that can do it. And um, we just, we just work that way. So we've, I've got a, probably a, about a, you know, a team of about less than 10 sub consultants that help me at any given time that I can lean on uh, whenever I need to. Got it. And when you're working in that type of model, what kind of margin are you typically seeing, you know, as you're working with those 1099s and other contractors? Um, is it kind of across the board, like a standard, you know, your, your margin is 30%, 60%, 80%. Can you kind of give us a sense of, of where you are as you're working with contractors as opposed to having employees full-time in-house? Yeah, I don't, it, it varies on job to job, but like um, my whole business is very high margin because we have such low overhead. We don't mm -hmm. have, uh, over, you know, employees, we don't have office buildings, cars, planes or anything like that. So it's very low overhead and high margin. But I'd say on my re most recent job, it was a small, small job. I think it was a $10,000 job, you know, and my sub consultants, uh, for everything was 25 or $3,500. Okay. You know? And so out of a $10,000, um, bill, bill, this was just one small one that comes sure. to mind, you know, so I don't know what the margin of that is, but <laughs> yeah, you might have like a, a 60, 65% give or take. I mean, it depends. Yeah. Everything else that you have going into, but on the, on the project basis, got it. Okay. And then, so you have a co-founder in that business, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mark, uh, Mark is my business partner and, um, in, um, in the, in the ADA consulting business as well as my SaaS company. Right. What's been your experience of, of having a partner? So you, know, you mentioned Sam, who's, who's like a brother to me. He's actually my cousin. Uh, our fathers are twins. Uh, we've been building multiple businesses together. We've sold businesses over the years. Um, and there's lots of good things, but what's been your experience of, of working with, you know, a, a partner or kind of a co-founder uh, in your business? Yeah, I, I have a different uh, take on it than I did probably 10 years ago. And uh, part of that is in the arrangement I have in our SaaS business, you know, great guys, great partners and everything, and as well as Mark in my other business. But moving forward, and what I teach is people is to, is somebody said this thing that the only ship that doesn't uh, float is a partnership. And I, I think that's true to some extent. You have to be, it's like a marriage, you know, and you have to be really, really careful. And I think a better approach for a lot of people is have one person be the lead, the prime, you know, the, 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 the owner, the shareholder, whatever it is on paper, and then have a high paid, even share the, the profits 50-50 with somebody, but make them not necessarily the owner um, in the LLC or the C Corp or whatever it is. Bring them on as a high paid um, you know, partner, but not a legal partner. I think that's the, and why, why is that? Well, like what's been, uh, your experience and whatever you're, you're comfortable sharing here, but just in terms of from, so that others can benefit from, um, you know, kind of being able to maybe see around the corner of what, what could come. It sounds like you're saying that maybe when it comes to leadership or kind of using the, the analogy of, of the, the ship, right? Like 
you know, maybe both people are trying to steer and in, in different directions and that could cause some, some issues. Is that kind of really what you're referring to or is there something beyond that? Yeah, that and also sometimes there's always when you have a even a 50-50 partnership, there's always in this this kind of cloud over the hanging, hey, I'm putting in 12 hours a day and Joe over here, my who's 50-50 partner is only putting in six hours or he's yeah. taking off to go with the family. I'm working over Labor Day weekend. You know, there's just that it just it just feels weird. Whereas if it's, if, if they're, and then, and then if it gets weird enough that you want to make a break, well now it's okay. How do we dispose of the company? Who gets what? And it's, it, unless it's, it's just, it can get really ugly really quick. Whereas if just one person was the lead and you were just a really high paid partner, um, a profit sharing partner, and now it's easy to make a clean break. Hey, you know, and also it's easy to say, Hey, whatever you earn or put in, you get, and whatever I do, I get. And then there's no, and then whatever we do jointly, we share on. Right. And that's kind of what, how we've structured it. Uh, Mark and I is that we have a, we have a, his, his line item, a, my line item, and then a, um, uh, a joint. And so when we do joint projects, but I never have to look over my shoulder with him, you know, he, he's semi-retired, so he'll work two hours a week, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't affect me the way we set it up. Right. And I think you have to be really careful and, um, um, you know, intentional on, um, on, on those things and get them vetted out early and don't just partner up with anybody because when you want to make a break, it can get ugly real quick. Yeah. I mean, this is a really good, um, I think discussion and kind of like what we're exploring here that may a lot of people don't think about much. Uh, what I've observed is that especially in the early days, uh, people tend to kind of lean on or look for a partner, uh, because they want to like offload certain things they're not comfortable doing. Uh, yes. And they, they think that's probably the best thing for them. But what they don't see is what, what you and I are discussing right now, which is what could happen in the future, right? And so all the legal stuff is so important to have in place. I mean, even though Sam is like, like a brother to me, he's a cousin, we've done businesses, multiple businesses together. We've had businesses separately. Uh, we've seen, you know, we've been through a lot, like challenging situations, but also really great experiences. Uh, but we have everything also documented and, you know, yeah. done professionally because, it's just, it's like a good insurance policy, yeah. right? It's the peace of mind. It's, you're probably never going to need it. Hopefully you won't. But if one day you do, it just keeps everything clear. And as he said, like, you know, you could be down the road and maybe at, at the beginning, you both were on the same kind of mindset and had the same understanding. But now when money's involved and different things happen, one party can kind of look at the other and go, well, no, that, I didn't think that. that's not what I meant. But mm -hmm. if you have everything documented properly, it's like, well, it doesn't matter what we're thinking right now. Here's what we agreed to at that time. And so here's what we're, you know, legally following. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I see a lot of people who are very successful uh, using or leveraging partnerships. We had Roland Frazier on the, the podcast not too long ago. He's a big, big proponent of uh, partnerships, but I also see a lot of people that are just leaning to partnerships because it seems like it seems like it could be something just easier to do. They could accomplish more, but they're not thinking long term. And then, in fact, they bring in the wrong person and uh, you know start to experience a lot of the things that you just mentioned. You've gone through as well, so uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Let's let's now switch then to talk about pricing because that's an area that you've done a lot of work in, um, and I really want to kind of hear from you in terms of like what's your experience um, when it comes to pricing projects as a consultant. And what do you see, Paul, as being kind of the biggest thing that holds uh, consultants back from earning higher fees on their engagements? <laughs> oh, they undervalue their services so, so badly. You know, we're all guilty of that. You know, we just, you know, we talked about this before, Michael, you and I, you know, the first sales yourself, as Alan Weiss says, and if you don't believe in the, in the value and the, the service that you're providing, neither will the marketplace or your clients. And um, I work with a lot of coaches, consultants, freelancers, you know, C-suites that want to go out on their own. And, and um, I'm like, you're charging what? what? You're, my perception is you should be way up here and you're way down there. And because what happens is what comes easy to them, they think is less valuable because it comes easy to them, you know, but it's what's easy to them is gold to somebody else. And, and so I think that's the biggest problem is, is that mindset. I know you're big on mindset and and, uh, and really, um, valuing yourself and not, uh, not, uh, not undervaluing and undercharging for your services. And so what do you say to someone who goes, okay, yeah, I get that, Paul. Like I know I need to be charging more, but something's holding me back. I'm, I'm just like, yeah, maybe I, I'm my average project right now is $15,000. I know it should be at $50,000 or more, but like, I just, I'm, I've been at this, you know, for a little while now and it's, nothing's really changed. Like, what, what do you say to that person? What, what have you found to be the, the difference in being able to go from where someone is right now to, to moving their fees up to that next level? 
it's changing that perception or their mindset is because what they're, what's holding them back is their view of the situation or their view of the value or their view of the $15,000. Mm-hmm. They're like, Oh, I can't charge 50. Cause that's, well, to you, that's a crazy amount, but to your client, that's pocket change. Mm-hmm. You know? So, so you, you have to, um, as our friend, um, um, Blair N says, you know, you price the client, not the service, you know, and, and, uh, in his book, pricing creativity, mm-hmm. and you just, you have to, you have to look at what the value is that you're bring, bringing, um, to the client and, and put, put the value, in, um, from their perspective, not your own, you know, quit being so dang, um, self-centered, look at it from your, your, um, client's point of view, not, uh, what the dollar amount is in your world. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, so you talked about the three pillars that you've used in your own consulting businesses that have kind of helped you to grow. Um, take us through what those three pillars are. Yeah. Yeah. Three pillars of revenue. Uh, um, they're basically, um, three things here. Let me, let me re- recap here. So number one is you got to have, um, in order to have a, a balance or a, to write out those highs and lows, you know, mm-hmm. in income, as you know, it comes, it comes and goes, you know, it's either feast or famine. And so what I talk about is the three pillars of revenue. And the first one is just your basic consulting services, you know, whatever your, your deliverables are that you're doing with your one-on-one client, your high ticket consulting and so forth. Then the second one is a training and education, or even could be speaking, um, uh, program. That's where I'm talking about getting out to chambers, industry conferences, right. um, and even getting paid for that. I say do, do up to two hours for free, anything over two hours up to eight or multiple days you should be paid for. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then the third revenue is an online e-presence, you know, where you have all your productized services, eBooks, um, all your freebies, lead magnets, you know, just like on the consulting success site, you have all sorts of great um, materials on there. So you have a great E presence. You also have a great, um, um, speaking and, um, you know, workshop and training, um, program. Right. And so, and then you have your regular consulting that you could do too for one-on-one. So you have all three of those pillars working together, which is why you're successful. And, and so for you, like going back to that, uh, American Disabilities Act and accessibility consulting business that you have, what, what were you doing? What's an example just for people to kind of um, maybe make it a little bit more tangible when you talk about an e-presence, right? Online presence, what were you guys doing at that time? Or is that something that you recognize like later on and maybe yet haven't done or just give us a sense of, yeah, what, what did that look like for you? Yeah, no, I stumbled across it on accident, but what ended up happening is there, there also was a regulatory, um, exam or testing, you know, so if you're in real estate, CEUs, I mean, there's lots of industries and verticals that have those type of regulatory or association CEUs. So if you can wrap some kind of a training or, um, online program that satisfies those requirements, that's a sweet spot because now you have a captive audience and that's exactly what we had. We, I put together, a, I just curated a bunch of comment, uh, um, content on the internet and put it into a, a, P, a PDF, mm-hmm. uh, charge $29 for it. I think in the first year we did like $29,000 in sales and that just happened by accident. You know, I was just like, I, I was, I was just putting it together to help people and thought, oh, you know, I'll put a price on it for 29 bucks and see yeah. what happens. Um, and and were you, were you actively marketing that like sending paid traffic to, or did you just put it up on your website or how did that work? Well, this was uh, this was Oh nine Oh 10. So there wasn't a whole lot of paid traffic yet, but, uh, but we were doing, I think I, I played with Google AdWords a little bit early on. The wild then, last days of Google AdWords. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also had, um, I was building my email list, um, because right. I had a lead mag, I had the old, just an old fashioned lead magnet PDF. So my email list grew, it's up to like 5,000 people now or 6,000 mm-hmm. and it just, uh, it just grew over time early on. And, and then I just ping those people and then like, you know, every day, you know, five, six, seven of those was, would sell. And, um, it was a great supplement when I first started out on my own. Nice. Um, so Paul, what habit have you developed that you feel is really just central to your success? Like a personal habit that you just feel really uh, has kind of catapulted and supported your success as a consultant, uh, business owner and, and leader? I think for me, the biggest thing is not being afraid to fail. I mm-hmm. mean, everybody thought I was crazy when I left in 09. I had three kids and a mortgage, you know, $3,000 a month pay mortgage. And in the heat of the recession, I mean, the stock market crashed, the world was ending. I mean, it was bad if you remember back then. Mm-hmm. And um, here I did, I left my 18 year career, full benefits, um, you know, high six figure 
uh, a year job and full benefits and retirement and went out on my own. Everybody thought I was crazy, but I, I, I knew I would succeed. I just, I just blocked it out and just, you know, and if I failed, I'd figure it out. And I still do that. I'll start things. I'll make mistakes. And I think uh, a lot of people don't act or, or, or are afraid to take action because they're afraid how they're going to look. What are people going to say? And you just, you know, life's too short, man. You just got to try it, see what works in course correct as you go. And don't be afraid of failure. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. I, I love that. I'm a big believer of the exact same thing. I don't, I don't really call failure failure. I call it a, you know, a learning experience. It's you get to learn. That's, uh, you know, there's no yeah. such thing as learning only positives. If you do something and it doesn't work out the way you, you thought, now you're closer to figuring out what does work because you've eliminated something that, that doesn't work. Right. And we see this all the time with our, our clients um, and in the coaching that we do with consultants that, you know, they'll try saying sometimes they're doing something that's uncomfortable. They're venturing, in, you know, into the kind of unknown zone because they're doing new yeah. things. Um, and there's hesitation around that. But the moment that you do it, you, you learn something, you might hit out of the park and that's fantastic. Or you might go, okay, that didn't work quite the way that I want to, but at least now I'm a lot closer to, you know, figuring out what does work and making that adjustment to my messaging or to my marketing. Um, and that consistency and taking action around it is what really, um, creates success for people. So, um, yeah, right on. Yeah. Great share. Yeah. And would you rather, you know, would we rather be on our deathbed going, man, I sure wish I would have launched that product instead of thought about it for 20 years, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so what I launched and I launched one, I launched my first, um, group coaching program, I think in May I had one sale, you know, and I was a little depressed at first and my wife saw me uh, sulking and she, she <laughs> kicked me in the butt, which she was a good thing. And I'm, I've, I'm course correcting and Hey, the market told me what I was doing was not, uh, what it wanted. So, yeah. I'm, I'm fixing that and good stuff. You know, nice. We all do. Um, so Paul, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. I want to make sure people can you know learn more about um, your consulting businesses and what you have going on right now. So where's the best place for them to go? You mentioned it was a paulkline.net. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Best place is at paulkline.net. Um, that's my webpage for my personal brand. I've got a free product pricing roadmap that talks about, you know, creating productized services and having your value ladder for your, for your different products and services, as well as anchoring uh, sheets that you can fill out. And then I also have the pricing is positioning podcast. We're up above, uh, I think, uh, 35 episodes or so. And Michael, you'll be on there coming up shortly. And, and uh, we've got a lot of great guests in the consulting world and so forth. So pricing is positioning.com or on your iTunes, Spotify app, as well as paulkline.net. Um, there we go. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll link all that up. Uh, Paul, again, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Michael.